the relationship between the church and science, and who is Charles's favorite founding father? Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast in podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a reactionary, Charles Coulot. Reactionary? You mean like an opponent of progress? Definitely. You mean someone who stands in the way of the march of history and says, stop? <laughs> yeah, like Tiananmen Square. A... <laughs> <laughs> that is sad. <laughs> That's, I'll tell you what, that's a, that's one sad comparison. <laughs> Stop. Well, all right, fine. But you know, I'm afraid you have misled our audience this evening. How is that? Because this is not just another episode. That's true. Come on, tell the people what it is. You it's can do it. 300th episode of off the menu 300 episodes ladies and gentlemen can you imagine eight years of the making 300 episodes and what what things you've seen in the past eight years we saw brexit we saw uh president uh we saw president trump elected we saw president trump dissected we saw President Trump dejected. We saw the COVID lockdown. We saw the hot, hot summer of burning love. And we saw the mostly peaceful protesters at the Capitol building. We saw the death of Queen Elizabeth II. We saw the coronation of King Charles III. And through it all, ladies and gentlemen, you have been with us, our gallant supporters, patrons in particular, but audience in general, I don't think we had intended, uh, we set out really with any specific time frame in mind. We just started doing it. Uh, and lo and behold, we're doing it eight years later, 300 episodes. Uh, so for all of you guys who have uh, stuck with us during all this, and all of you who've come on since at different times, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or to put this another way, Thanks a lot. Mm, yeah. We're at that time of year. What time of year? Funny you should ask. The time of year when Christmas is slowly winding down with the month of January. Because we're doing this in real time on the night of the 20th. Tomorrow is January 21st. January 21st is the anniversary of the murder of King Louis XVI. And starting today, or actually yesterday, throughout France and in various other places, Belgium, Italy, and a few places in the United States, requiem masses for the repose of the soul of King Louis XVI, often accompanied with readings of his will and his vow to the Sacred Heart, his consecration of France to the Sacred Heart. But the 25th is coming. What's the 25th, you ask? I'm glad you asked that question. It's the birthday of Robert Burns, the national bard of Scotland. In many ways, the forerunner of Sir Walter Scott. And that's about the worst Scots burr you'll ever hear. But at any rate, as a result, all over Scotland and the Scottish diaspora, in England, Wales, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United States, India, Singapore, wherever there are enough Scotsmen to do it, there will be burn suppers for the rest of the month. And these always follow a very rigid guideline, including the address to the haggis and the uh, uh, the toast to the immortal memory of uh, Robert Burns, the toast to the lassies, the toast to the laddies. Usually the haggis is piped in. There's a procession. There's lights. There's lots of scotch whiskey, tatties and deeps. 
uh, potatoes and turnips, in other words. Uh, oh, it's great fun. But that's centered around uh, the 25th, which is Robert Burns' birthday. The 28th is the Feast of Blessed Charlemagne, my name day. But wait, there's more. It has a liturgical uh, uh, mass, as most masses tend to make, a proper mass to it, uh, which today is primarily to be seen in Aachen and Frankfurt. And it's a good time to remember the father of Europe, the founder of the Holy Roman Empire. But wait, there's more. On January the 30th is the day that King Charles I of England, Scotland, Ireland, and the American colonies was murdered by Oliver Cromwell. And at his statue in uh, London at Trafalgar Square, there'll be a wreath laying by the Royal Stuart Society There'll be a mass organized by the Society of King Charles the Martyr at Banqueting House, very close by, which is actually where he was murdered. Uh, and then all over the Anglosphere, there'll be observances uh, by his devotees. The following day, January 31st, is the death day of Bonnie Prince Charlie. His great-grandson, uh, the last Stuart to make a, uh, a serious effort to retake the throne. So that's January. When January is finished, though, we've got the 1st of February, which is Candlemas Eve, about which, let's see, what, what, is, uh, what is next? Uh, what's, what's next week? We'll next, still be in January. January 29th is, next, is the following Monday. Yeah. So uh, next week we'll talk about Candlemas and uh, Mardi Gras which will be coming up. But these are the last gasps of Christmas. So clutch whatever ornaments you've still got, grab the holly and the ivy, all that good stuff. Excellent. All right. Um, yeah, just shameless plug uh, for Patreon. If you, we're trying to go from 300 to 400, uh, you, can, you guys can help us to do that. Sign up to become a patron for as low as $5 a month. Get access to the pre-show, uh, which is typically about 40 minutes long. Um, get early access to, to all the full episodes. Um, and get your questions asked. If you have questions for Charles, that's the way to do it. Become a patron. I'm here lying in wait for them. All right. That sounds pretty sinister, doesn't it? Yeah. Almost like you're a spider or something. <laughs> all right. Poor little questions. They don't deserve that kind of abuse. Poor little question, wandering along, doing its own thing. Do, 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 and then, <laughs> Sheila bounces <laughs> up, poor thing. Wow. All A right. Sad, sad day for the little questions. <laughs> All right, question from Zenix, who says, Sal Salutations to the Don who commands the brawn, and the beatnik to whom charges will not stick. This time I define ye by your relationships with Tyrone and Clancy to show the interconnectedness of this diverse community. Oh, that, I like that. That's, that's beautiful. beautiful. That, that, we're that's... very, very, yeah, we're very diverse here. It's, it's true. Get all unity and diversity in the world. That's what it's about. Reciprocity. It's you know, key. one hand washes the other. The key to every relationship, reciprocity. That's what I always well, say. The whole city of Arcadia runs on reciprocity. <laughs> it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually a line. Do you know who I quoted? Oh. Reciprocity is the key to every relationship. It's um, Captain Dudley Smith from who? L.A. Confidential. Oh, yes. Dudley, oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And and I'm I'm in turn reminded of uh, Baba uh, Morton from Chicago, right? You know, she comes out. And she says, "Ask any of the chickies in my pen; they'll tell you I'm the biggest mother hen. I love all of them, and all of them love me because the system works. The system called reciprocity." <laughs> And then she goes on to explain at great length that, you know, 
when you're good to mama, mama's good to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to give the impression that either Dun Smith or Mama Morton were uh, uh, dishonest in any way. Right. All right. Um, would Charles please comment on the Catholic reaction to romanticism and neoclassicism as movements charged by questionable emotion and reason? Well, this is a, a very interesting and a very complex uh, question, to be honest with you, because um, both romanticism and neoclassicism had Catholic and non-Catholic elements. So let's unpack that, shall we? Romanticism was very much a reaction and a response to the so-called Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, which of course culminated in the blood and horror of the French Revolution. So this period that prided itself on being all about thought being modern and scientific and all that, ended up in utter barbarism. Well, the romantics, the romantic response to that was the elevation of the emotions of the individual, a turning back to the past, especially the Middle Ages, uh, and uh, one of a better word, uh, altered states of consciousness, dreams, uh, childhood, the savage, the exotic. Uh, and as you can guess, that's a very amorphous sort of thing, and it lent itself to all all kinds of elements. But the medieval-esque wing of Romanticism was very, very much responsible for the Catholic revival of the early 19th century. People like Chateaubriand in France, Novalis and uh, August von Schlegel in Germany, uh, Sir Walter Scott in Scotland, and their many disciples uh, looked again at the Middle Ages and said, you know, these guys do what they were doing, and they're a lot smarter than we are. Uh, now, there was sort of a... There were people like... Uh, Joseph de Mestre, uh, Auguste de Bernal, uh, Xavier Baroche, a, a number of these uh, counter-revolutionary writers who were definitely coming from Romanticism. However, uh, as Romanticism of the 19th century continued, uh, nationalism uh, became uh, a thing, a big thing, in part because of romanticism. The phrase romantic nationalism uh, refers to the, not just the revival of the interests of the past in, in Scotland and England and France and so on, but also the uh, uh, peoples of Central Europe began, uh, each of them, a sort of linguistic and cultural revival. And that very often put them uh, in conflict with each other. So the Hungarians, for instance, became very nationalistic. But the minorities that lived under them, the Slovaks, the Romanians, the Croats, they did the same thing. Uh, you had a big revival in, uh, in Russia of uh, Russian peasantry and all that. that had been sort of looked down on since Peter the Great. But the same thing was happening with the Poles and the Finns and the Lithuanians and the Lats. So everybody got very much of their own thing. And this fed into a sort of left-wing romanticism, which culminated in the revolutions of 1848. So uh, romanticism could be a double-edged sword. And there was a fellow, uh, Charles Maurras in France, uh, and he had a number of, of uh, disciples, including uh, T.S. Eliot in England, who we discussed as a, uh, his Brahmin side in the pre-show. But uh, he kind of transcended that when he emigrated to England, and he became very much an Anglo-Catholic and a papalist Anglo-Catholic. <clears throat> so 
these folks said, well, no, romanticism, the, it, it uh, lends itself to the left, to the outraged passions and so forth, whereas neoclassicism uh, brings us, once again, the, the, the intellect, the mind, all that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, T.S. Eliot made the famous comment that he was in politics a royalist, in religion an Anglo-Catholic, and in literature a classicist. And Ross uh, would have said something similar, although he wasn't, uh, for most of his life, a, a believing Catholic. He felt that Catholicism was ultra-important to France, and this was another interesting thing in that his nationalism, for all that he said that romanticism had done Europe a disservice and so on and so forth, his nationalism was heavily infused with romanticism. And he put the nation, specifically the French nation, at the center of everything. Oddly enough, his disciples of foreign countries, Spain, Austria, etc., would do the same thing. But while he was very much a French nationalist, he was also a Provençal. And he was a great believer in the separate identity of the Provençals as opposed to the rest of the French. He saw France as being sort of a, a jigsaw puzzle of lesser nationalities. So he would have been very much against Provence or Brittany or French Flanders seceding from France. But he'd been all in favor of their cultivating Provençal, Breton, Flemish in speaking. In other words, uh, he attempted to transcend the tension between small nationalities and larger political groupings. And that was something that his Spanish and Portuguese and uh, other disciples also wrestled with. Most of his disciples were devout Catholics. Uh, now, unfortunately, he was not. And he and a number of his disciples, they tend to reverse, they tended to reverse reality when it came to the importance of the nationality. And what do I mean by that? Well, the real importance of the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese is their reflection in their own ways of the Catholic faith. That's the importance of French culture, Spanish culture, Portuguese culture. But for Maras and his followers, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, the importance of Catholicism was that it embodied the spirit of France, of Spain, of Portugal. You had the same thing with Russia and Orthodoxy as far as the Slavophiles were concerned. And again, the believer would say, well, no, the nation is, is all important, but only to the degree that it reflects the faith. The faith is not important to the degree that it reflects the nation. So they would say that Maras had it the wrong way around. It was on that basis that L'Action Francaise was condemned by Pope Pius XI in 1926. This was actually a very bad move. It was reminiscent of the Rally of Mont of Leo XIII in the 1880s, but it was worse. Cardinal Billot, who was a great supporter of L'Action Francaise, was signed the red hat over at T.S. Eliot. Uh, did not come into the Catholic Church because of it. Uh, and one of the very first things Pius XII did when he succeeded Pius XI in 1939 was to quash the condemnation. But in that 13-year period, members of L'Action Francaise who refused to leave the movement uh, were denied Catholic burial, denied the sacrament, the sacraments. It was a terrible injustice. You know, one of the sad things about Pius XI, when you look at his dealing with Lexo Francaise, with the Cristeros and so on, few popes have written as wonderful things as he did. And yet his political sense when it came to practicality was very often not good. Can't have everything. So, at any rate, uh, Laxor Francais was somewhat uh, discredited by that adventure, but it got a lot back when 
Pius XII rehabilitated them. But then came World War II. And like saint Francais, like the entire Catholic right in Europe, were forced to choose between resistance and collaboration. And in the beginning in France, when it seemed that uh, Vichy was really in charge, it was a Catholic-esque regime and so on, uh, a lot of very fine people joined it. But as the war went on and the the obvious, I mean, Pétain and the rest of the Vichy regime had in mind the regeneration of France. That was the last thing the Germans wanted, certainly the last thing that Hitler wanted. So the Catholic and traditionalist element was progressively forced out of Vichy and replaced with socialists and communists. Uh, and so a lot of those guys, of Laxo Francais and so on, ended up in the resistance. But they were, uh, you know, they perforce fought alongside socialists, communists, and liberals. And then after the, uh, after the war was over, uh, after the war ended, uh, they were eventually condemned to irrelevance. And so now, uh, on, on the on the ruins of those ideas came Christian democracy, which in the beginning was as much of the Catholic right-wing program as anyone could get across under the Soviet-American diarchy, which ruled Europe. Uh, and today, even that's gone. And most of the parties that call themselves Christian Democrat, uh, they're employment offices for the politicians. But a big piece of that was the uh, the Catholic hierarchy's refusal to support them in the 60s and 70s when it came time to do battle with things like abortion. Okay, uh, so um, I want to take it really far back. Um, we were talking more directly about Romanticism, um, and um, you're citing a lot of authors looking to uh, medieval thought as no. perhaps a golden age or they're smarter um sort of uh kind of like the theme of midnight in paris where each, each uh, bit, a little bit uh, well not really because the middle ages were seen as incarnating christianity in a way that no other period had mm. okay i mean it wasn't simply older is better okay it was the specifics. Uh, I mean, they preferred the classicists, the neoclassicists preferred to look to Greece and Rome and the Renaissance. But the uh, the Romanticists specifically looked to the Middle Ages. They saw in, Goth in Gothic, for instance, the epitome of, of Christian architecture. So in England, just to take one example, uh, out of Sir Walter Scott's work and out of the Catholic revival, the Oxford movement, and all that. You had the work of uh, Augustus Pugin, who was a great neo Gothic architect and a Catholic. Uh, in his wake followed people like uh, John Ruskin and William Morris, who started the arts and crafts movement that sort of flowed out of it. Uh, and their idea was. And there was a, a lot of neo medievalism in it, but more importantly, was the use of uh, handicrafts and so on rather than factory, uh, factory uh, to find stuff. Out of that flowed Art Nouveau, which, as the name will tell you, was about the new art. But nevertheless, the quote unquote new art, the Art Nouveau, uh, still harkened back to medieval. Uh, standards and craftsmanship and so on and so forth. So these things all had a way of blending into one another. Uh, you, you know, the the uh, the uh, whole idea, for instance, of the, the arts and crafts is a series of workshops as opposed to factories and that kind of thing. So it, it, it was much more than simple nostalgia. <clears throat> it was a belief that the Middle Ages specifically 
had gotten it right in a way that uh, succeeding periods and preceding periods had not. Did the middle, the people living in the Middle Ages feel that way? Well, yeah. I mean, they didn't know much about the future because it hadn't happened yet. But certainly they believed that the uh, conversion of their various countries had produced the best possible civilization. Okay. I mean, one of my little jokes about the Inquisition is that it, that uh, is that we live in precisely the kind of world it was founded to prevent from getting born. Right. It failed. And now we have what we have. Sylvia Plath is a great poetess. What? Everything's wonderful in this best of all possible worlds. All right. Uh... Don't you ever wish Jack O'Lantern would come back from retirement? I do. All right. Uh, Anita says, greetings and happy Epiphany Tide. Two questions. First, I have just been watching Charles's thoughts on Lord North uh, from the last week and why he is one of Charles's favorite British prime ministers. And a question occurred to me. Did George III really go mad or was this label put on him to put the kibosh, the kibosh on his attempts to roll back the Whig oligarchy. No, he, he did go mad. Uh, but that was, for the most part, he had an episode but uh, earlier. But for the most part, his madness occurred after he had lost the battle with the oligarchy. Hmm. The, uh, I mean, during the... Uh, he was quite reasonable and rational during some of the most strain-filled periods of his reign. But the problem with Porphyria, which is what they think uh, he had, is that as you get older, it gets worse. And that's what happened to him. So. I see. All right. Uh, what is the mysterious incident in episode 299 that you comment on but do not specify wherein Charles ended his television career forever? Oh. Well, that was sort of a come-to-Jesus moment. Way back in 2005, I was hired by ABC to uh, comment on the papal ceremonies, the papal funeral, uh, the uh, conclave itself, the inauguration uh, mass of Benedict the Sixteenth. It was roughly a two-week period, more or less. And this was a great job because they sent a car for me every day to take me to the studio. And that was nice. And they, uh, they were pleased with my commentary. They were pleased with what I did. So the week after the inauguration, they decided to put me on one of these weekend shows where you've got uh, talking heads basically commenting on different things. And in, in in this case, there were four of us scattered around the country, or five of us, and there were two moderators, one in Washington, one in New York. So it was going along fine, you know, what are the prospects for the future, this, that, and the other. But then the question came, I was asked, what do you think of the late John Paul II's views of the United States? Well, I knew what I was supposed to say. What I was supposed to say was something along the lines of the poor dumb Polak didn't understand how wonderful our democracy is and how great we are and just didn't really get our perfection. Well, this was a live nationwide feed, which meant that couldn't be edited. So I decided I would do something honest. And I started out by looking at the two gentlemen and saying, well, you know, we Americans are extremely provincial people. We don't understand ourselves very well, let alone foreigners. The late Holy Father had had a real education, the like of which most of us in media never get. And he had a real life, you know. He'd, he'd been in two resistance movements. He'd been a, a minor. He'd been an actor. Again, very much unlike those of us in the media. Plus, he traveled all over the world. He'd seen all sorts of people. 
So I think it's fair to say he probably understood us a lot better than we understand ourselves. Well, the looks of the two of them, I, you talk about icy, just shh. And not another question was asked for the rest of the hour of me. And I just sat there and I, I knew what I had done. And when we were finished, the cameraman said to me, he was a black guy, and he goes, made a cool home now, which is great. Absolutely great. You ain't never going to work here again, but that was just great. And of course, he was right. They never asked me back. So that was 2006? Five. 2005. Um, so, but who's counting? So that's almost 20 years ago. Yeah. And so. Is that um, does so is that hurt, that literally it prevents hurtful? you from from going on television now? Like, is there some sort of list? Is there some sort of black list where oh, that you're on so. this, where it's like, oh, Coulomb? T- I doubt it. I doubt it very highly. I mean, yeah, you know, I was I was always small fish at the very best. Remember, they've got a ton of people who want to, who want, they, they can use. They've got a huge pool. They don't need me. Uh, you know, who am I? They've got all sorts of people they can draw on. So, no, no. I knew what I was doing when I, I set fire to my career. But I don't regret it. It was fun. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, you say set fire, but also, like, I feel like the, that opportunity is available should it come up again. No? I mean, like, if something for the Habsburgs should happen and they need some historical... Uh, color commentary? I probably would be the last one they'd ask. They'd want someone who hates the Habsburgs. <laughs> okay. And there, and there are plenty of, of, pet, uh, of pet trade monkeys in academia <laughs> who can, you know, make the, make the noises and the sounds that they're supposed to make. You know, and of course, remember that, that uh, the way to operate is by always having the same sorts of voices saying the same things. Over and over again. You see? Many, many mouths all spouting the same tribe. It's very important. Because, I mean, if you had real diversity, the whole system would collapse. Why? I mean, why? What what if people started thinking? What if people started having ideas they're not supposed to have? What then? Smart guy. It could disrupt anything from voting patterns to consumer patterns. Consumer patterns. That's an interesting thought. So lack of diversity in thought interrupts, or excuse me, diversity of yeah. thought interrupts consumer patterns. Hmm. That's... I mean, people might stop and ask themselves, why are we buying this crap? Uh, I mean, that almost goes into the nature of people. And that's a lot of people being really philosophical. Yeah. Uh... I mean, stop and think about it for a second. What if a majority of people began to think, wait, there's Walmart. And there are somewhat more expensive mom and pop shops right in the center of my town. And these are not a faceless uh, corporation. These are real people. How would that look? I mean, what if people stopped shopping at Walmart and major chains and started, as they say, shopping locally? these mom and pop stores it would be horrible think of all the uh, think of all the disruption in the lives of the innumerable employees of everybody from walmart to uh, amazon that'd be terrible i think you're presuming i, I think you're making a lot of presumptions um that, I uh, of, of what people don't do see i think you've made a presumption that people aren't 
aware of why they're buying from Amazon. I think people are perfectly well, uh, aware that why they're buying from Amazon and Walmart. Well, they they don't, want the lowest price. Of course they do. What they don't think about is what the actual expense of the lowest price really is. And it doesn't. I, it's almost. I'll give you. Uh, let me let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, now it's gotten a little bit better in a lot of places, but in the seventies and eighties, one of the big big phenomena around the country were the growth of malls. And usually these were on the outskirts of towns. And they were filled for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, with chain stores. What this did in town after town all across the country was empty the downtown. So you would have these often very beautiful architecturally, but empty, dead town centers, which depending on the size of the town would become a focus for crime and you know, all sorts of problems while everybody shopped out at the mall. Now, it was cheaper, that's for sure. Chains will always be cheaper. But more of the money that goes into the community, into community stores, stays in the community. And it makes it it makes it possible for people to be more independently employed because you know what happens it's not just the vast majority of people shop at chains the vast majority of people are employed by them and it's very difficult to have an independent commercial retail section i mean you do it but it's nothing it's nothing like the size of the uh, the number of people employed by the chains the one thing to be said for it is that all this stuff is cheaper. But there is a cost. It's a long-term cost. and People aren't think, used to thinking of the long term. But basically what it does is erode the identity of the economy of the local, the local place. People identify less and less and less with their local sections. They care about them less and less. And the uh, the community as a whole suffers. Uh, I I kind of I kind of disagree a little bit uh, in terms of like the perspective. I, I um I feel like it's they're aware of all of this, but it's the path of least resistance. Well, yeah, it is the path of least resistance. But if they really thought more about what that involves. I mean, look, let's put it this way. If I give free booze to everybody, probably the number of alcoholics will zoom up. But on the other hand, if more people are aware that there's a danger in free booze, uh, some mean, of them won't. Uh, what, what, what I'm trying to say is you're, you're saying it's, it's a lack of thought. To me, it's a lack of strength of will. That's what I'm saying. You know, I'd say it's both at once. And certainly the, uh, the media that we have, the culture that we have, contributes to the weakening of the will. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, well, if, if you eat healthy, maybe you'll live longer and you, won't, you, you'll, um, you can prevent heart disease and some of these other things, right? Oh, if you think. Well, yeah, I yeah, know uh, that. But then doing is a different thing, right? Fast food is cheaper. Yeah. What do you what do you want a uh, a box of uh, box of chicken nuggets from McDonald's? And no, I don't know what part of the chicken they come from to answer your question. Chicken nuggets from McDonald's uh, are always cheaper than a uh, than a good Chinese chicken salad. I mean, you know, as a lazy person, where um, it, every it, it's. A, to me, it's not a, a matter of thought. I feel like I've thought everything out. It's a matter of, of doing. Uh, it's a matter of like, for example, for me, going to work. It's a matter of um, like the first choice in the day is, well, I can go and I can put on a three-piece suit, but that takes time and I have to think about it and it's pretty hard. Or I can put on um, a collared shirt and loosely match it with um, some, um, some khakis and then that's it. Right, like well, I can, you can mail it in. It's, it's... I'd recommend the three-piece suit. 
Well, well I know, but that's hard. That's hard, right? Oh. And, and, and you can talk about long-term psychological impact, outlook but, on but life, imagine, all these imagine things. A setup, imagine a setup where you don't even know there are such a thing as three-piece suits. Well, you forget well, how uh, dubbed out everybody really well, see, is. It, well, that's actually even what? more on the side that pushes you to action because you're on the side um, where it's more purposeful and meaningful where it's like, yeah, now that you know, I do that, it, like doing that is creating an awareness in and of itself. It's not even just I, about I, me. I, I can see that, but I tell you, the the system works to keep you stupid. It also works to weaken your will. Oh, and these two things, these two things do conjoin. Okay. Well, to, to give us what we have. I I definitely agree. I, I mean, uh, I just I I just wanted to sh to give a shout out to the low will people out there. Well, you know, <laughs> like myself. Yeah, I I I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that, but the never sell stupid short either. Uh, we were discussing before the show, ladies and gentlemen, how AI is getting dumber yeah. through its interaction with stupid people. Yeah. And that that's kind of a funny thing. You know, the this is what was left out of uh, Terminator. <laughs> you know, because if Terminator, I mean, now our experience is that AI gets stupider and stupider because of its interaction with human beings. So you can imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger being, oh, oh, what? He's got a pistol. He doesn't take the safety off. <laughs> Don't work. Actually, no one took the safety off Arnold Schwarzenegger. Himself, I mean. <laughs> yeah, there, there's not a lot of intelligence to put into the robots right now. No, no, it's not. I think it's an alien plot. Oh. I think that the mothership is sending stupid beams down. And the proof of the pudding is that they hit the leadership first. That's right. They're even stupider than their subjects, and we're pretty dumb. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, who? Oh, John has a bunch of good questions. A question from him is, who is Charles's favorite founding father? Oh, boy, that is a good question. I would say King Philip II of Spain, who was responsible for the first permanent settlements in the United States, in Florida and New Mexico. You know what he means, Charles. Louis XIII of France. The founding uh, the, fathers of the United States of America. What do you think Florida and New Mexico are? Poland? <laughs> okay, so let's make this very clear. Okay. Here is going to be your choice of people. You're going to need to pick your favorite. John Adams, Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Hancock, John Jay, Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, Robert R. Livingston, James Madison, George Mason, Robert Morris, Peyton Randolph, Roger, Sh Roger Sherman, and George Washington. Take your pick. Washington. Why? Why not? First in war, first in peace, first in arts. First <laughs> no, he, uh, I mean, after all, he started the French Indian War that uh, uh, ended the conquest of my people by the Angla, which is why we're doing this show in English. So, you know, there's that. Uh, he broke his oath to the king. So there's that. He did voluntarily give up power. And actually, George the Third made the comment when he got the news that Washington had given up po uh, power in the army and got back to Mount Vernon. Uh, George the Third said, "If this be true, the General Washington is the greatest man of the age." Hmm. So I'm not going to dissent from the uh, the king's view. Okay. Uh. John also wants to know your thoughts on Generation X 
And also the greatest the greatest generation or GI generation. We've wow, heard, so we've, he's... we've heard enough about the boomers already, Charles. Let's let's talk about these other ones. So your parents' generation. We've heard enough about the boomers. Yeah. But we were misunderstood. Nobody understands that a whole generation suffered to make a better tomorrow for those who would be younger than us. Why are you rolling your eyes? You're supposed to look happy and agree. Say, that's right. You're not doing it. You know, I, I can smell the cynicism 6,000 miles away. You look at my generation as a bunch of, of, of self-absorbed frauds. Self-absorbed frauds? Yes. I don't know if they're frauds. I don't know if they – I don't know if I would say that. I don't know if you guys intended to be frauds. Of course we – I mean, what? I mean, you wanted your – I mean, you ended up selling out on all of your initial values, or a lot of we them. We did not. I feel Abortion, like – Abortion, free love, total total immorality, a complete lack of standards. Uh, the corporatism and the corporate messaging uh, – and all that, all of the consumerism, what the, what happened to that? Well, that was the way <laughs> of uh, that was the way of accomplishing our higher goal of no well, no standards well, and no what, what happened to the nonconformity? Well, okay, well, you know, you gotta you gotta you gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> You can't have everything in this life. Okay. Uh, we got rid of standards and morals. What more do you want? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. You think it was easy? That's good enough for me. You think it was easy me. to do? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, fine. Let's let, let me tear my eyes away from me <laughs> and, and, and mine and, and look at the, the old people and the young people. Firstly, the greatest generation, so-called, was the day we came up with uh, partly out of guilt to uh, confuse the fact that while growing up, we were pretty abusive to our parents. No, I'm saying we and us, I wasn't. But in general, uh, the World War II generation were kind of aghast, I think, at what they ended up producing in terms of uh, people. But mind you, they had their own, uh, they had their own, uh, their own loosening up themselves. I mean, World War II itself uh, paved the way for a great loosening of morals and standards. My dad always said that you wouldn't have had the 60s without the Second War. Uh, you know, I looked at him and I said, I asked what, what the worst thing that had ever happened in the country in his time had been. And I thought he was going to say the 60s, something like that. He said, World War II. I said, Dad, we won World War II. And he looked at me like I was a moron and said, son, you win a war the way you win an earthquake. The social damage that conflict did to the United States has never been repaired. And he ticked off a number of things, but he made a good point, made a good case. Incidentally, January 21st, uh, tomorrow, if he was still alive, he'd be 98. So I'll just ask our listeners and readers and viewers to uh, remember Guy Kulov in your prayers. Anyway, so we uh, the the greatest generation too. Uh, I mean, I remember when Brother Leonard Mary invited me to uh, accompany him to his reunion from Harvard, the class of 1942. And I remember his shock when he asked if the class dinner would be black tie. And the uh, the organizer said, "Oh, black ties, certainly not." Hmm. They'd already, you know, on the very idea. Oh, oh, oh. Which kind of annoyed the old man because he uh, he was all set for a black tie dinner, but obviously his contemporaries were not. Um. 
Yeah, let's switch around this question a little bit to give it a different structure. Um, so you seem to have an opinion. Uh, I, I do. I've where, got several, actually. Where that each subsequent generation is a little dumber than the prior one, right? To some extent. By and large. By yeah. and large. Yeah, I mean, like something is lost on each subsequent generation, right? I mean, is it yeah. like like pieces falling off of the greater whole? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they know less, they learn less. Uh, part of it, I think, you know, the in a, in a real sense, the apex of American nationhood was 1865 to 1941. That before that we were a, uh, a nation of semi-independent states. After that we were an empire. But in terms of being a country like other countries, that was pretty much about it. And it was during that per period that uh, a lot of our best literature came out. A lot of our holiday celebration styles came out in other words a lot of what it was to be an american emerged in that short period uh after the uh, after the war after the second war we had the transition to being an imperial power but we really were not suited for it for a number of reasons um uh, and the the democratic ideal became really corrosive in a way that it hadn't been before. The dumbing down, the equality, etc. Uh, and the left pretty much absorbed the uh, cultural life of the country without any real opposition at all from the quote-unquote conservatives because they they were really classical liberals, and so were more interested in economic and political freedom than they were in the culture wars. Now, mind you, I'm painting with a broad brush. Obviously, there were individuals who weren't like that. But by and large, you couldn't imagine an Eisenhower Republican uh, wanting to reform the university system. Sure. So uh, what I wanted to get to is um, instead of a degradation from generation to generation is um, what aspects have improved as we've gone from greatest generation to the boomers to generation X to the millennials? Oh, the only things that have improved are technological communications, medicine, etc. The knowledge uh, of that. Yeah. And the, the, the use of it. I mean, obviously, we were in touch with each other in a way that would have been impossible even when I was young. I mean, look, look, look at the show we've got. Uh, but I, I'm talking about character attributes, you know, like in, I can't, a, as I, a people. I can't think of any. I, I thought you had told me uh, one that was interesting because um, we were talking about. Um, what comes after millennial? I don't know if it was millenni young millennials or um, I'm on the older side of the millennials. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, there, there is uh, the – you've got Generation X, you've got the millennials, Generation Z uh, or Z. They're, in a lot of the young people of that sort, they don't have the illusions that my, my right. generation has. Right. That's what I was trying to get to where um, we were talking about it, and I remember you said to me um, – because I felt like somebody lit a fire in the youngest generations that the older generations don't have. And you said no, something that's... to me like, Vinny, all they've known is Obama and transgenderism. That's all they know. Yeah. That's all they know. And yet there is a uh... – there is a – because what we're pushing is so unnatural to the human spirit, to human nature – there is a pushback on the part of some in, in every successive generation. And I suspect that that will become greater and greater. The downside is that it doesn't have a great deal of education, a great deal of knowledge about this stuff. 
you can have the very best uh, the very best uh, uh, motivations in the world, right? Uh, but if you don't know how to make a wheelbarrow, you can't make a wheelbarrow. Now, we live in a time when only a minority, for, just to give you one example, of uh, children are born into a, uh, into a two-family, a two-parent family. So you're talking about people who don't really know from personal experience what family life is supposed to be about. They just don't. Now they can read about it. They can try it. And some of them will succeed, without a doubt. But that kind of damage cannot be overcome in 10 or 15 or 20 years. It takes a long time. And it takes the leadership of the society to be behind it. See, right now, the leadership, such as it is, are behind the opposite. They're behind the ruin of the family. They, they favor the ruin of the family. When I say they're behind it, I don't mean they're, they've ordered it from on high, but they favor policies that will destroy the family. They favor policies that atomize the individual. Now, when you're atomized, it's not just, it's, it's like unto not knowing what it's like being in a family. We don't know what it's like to live in communities, really. We don't know what it's like. We don't have that sense of dependence and uh, obligation toward, dependence upon and obligation toward our neighbors. You go out on the street, you look up and down, do you know anybody in those houses? No, of course not. And they don't know you. Now, there are places, of course, and that's not, not true, but there aren't many. We're all very atomized. And so... We don't really know what it is to live in a functioning community of, of neighbors who look after one another, even if they don't like each other. We don't know what that's about. I feel like in the younger generations, because there's so much missing, there is this very deep, very profound yearning. But, they, yearning. but, but, but they don't know how to – they don't know what to do. You they know? don't, and the man who will, the man who will really accomplish something, is the one who can somehow get it across to them, and who comes up with a way to bring this stuff to them. And again, we don't know about being in communities, so we don't know what it is to be uh, uh, citizens of a county or a city. We don't know what it is to have a civic pride. We don't know what it is to be a loyal subject of a state or province. And a country, what's that? I mean, you've got half the uh, leadership of the world of all these various countries attacking patriotism as fascism. Well, you know, when you're ruled by somebody with no brain who, lo who thinks like that, how do you regain? I mean, I, mean, I, I had a fellow who uh, asked me a very good question. I, I read the, uh, the Ten Commandments of Chivalry. And one of them is, thou shalt love the land in which thou wast born. Mm. And he asked me flat out, what does that mean? The concept had never occurred to the guy. He's, he's a brilliant moron. But the concept of the land in which you were born because you were born there. You know, again, our masters have no patriotism. Not, not national not uh, not uh, local, not multinational, you know? They have no, uh, it's not just that they don't uh, love their countries. They don't really love humanity, you know? They don't love the greater cultural blocks of which every country is a part. They, they're, they're just about their own worthless selves. And they've done their best to see that their subjects reflect them. We're all about us. It's all about me. In a thousand different ways, we have heard that message for decades. You know, they uh, call the 70s the me decade. Well, 
The eighties were kind of the re decade. They just kind of repeated stuff. The nineties, the zeros, the teens, and now the twenties. It's all basically we're reduced to animals. Because human beings, you know, human beings have real individuality, of course. That's a, as key a part of human nature as being in community. But being in community, being a part of concentric communities, is also a huge part of being human. You know, we, we are being treated like animals. You know, uh, for some reason that um, I just kind of made a connection here. The whole equality thing sort of treats us like animals. Like animals are equal. Right, like you don't no. you don't differentiate between chickens. You don't, you know, a commodity has the same price, right? Like the price no. of chickens, the price of beef. Um, I, you guys have no idea how many frustrating comments we get on YouTube and how much we have to deal with. Um, I'll read one right now to show you. Um, this your comment just made me think of this. So on our video for integralism, we're talking about integralism discussing it this guy says anything that promotes inequality in terms of rights actually is fascism not too hard to believe people who believe in a medieval religion also believe in the same outdated uh, by hundreds of years politics that's fascinating whoa. he's so whoa, uneducated whoa. he calls it a medieval religion well I, I think that speaking as a moron he has a right being a, being an idiot and not knowing anything at all, he has a right to express his opinion, and I'm glad that uh, many like him are able to vote. I mean, you know, what he dismisses is a medieval religion. Everything we have of beauty came out of that quote-unquote medieval religion. He should live in a, a beauty-free zone, just a box. Because art, beauty, where does that come from? It all comes to that terrible religion. But he's right, though. I think he's got the, the system he deserves. And I hope he's enjoying it. I hope he eats it. Right. Um... But I mean that in the most beautiful, loving way possible. But uh, to go back to your speech, that was um, where you're saying, like, we don't know how to live as a community. We don't know how to do that. I think that kind of roused um, sentiments and emotions in everyone. And really, you know, it, those aspirations are exciting. But again, how do you do that? <laughs> it's, you know? it's, it's very difficult. I mean, one of the ways that people do exercise that are interest groups, you know, whether it's uh, science fiction fandom or the Renaissance Fair, or sports. You know, sports still give a lot of people a feeling of community. That's the, very true. Uh, I didn't even think of that. Well, it's, it, you know, I mean, think of how people support the Dodgers or the uh, the Clippers or the, uh, what's the, the other? Uh, the Lakers, that's right. That's what I was thinking of. The Lakers, the Clippers, the, the Dodgers, the Giants. How, uh, I mean, how Angelinos get excited about these things. You know, one of the few things that still brings people together from across many different ethnic and class lines is a game at Dodger Stadium. Hmm. You know, now my deal when they've got trannies dancing and so forth, it's, you know, they're able to get even into that. Even into baseball, the, 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 the fat face of the stupid is to be seen. <laughs> the moron rules with his idiotic laugh. Hee hee hee. The fat face of the stupid. The fat face of the stupid. Did you get that from somewhere? No. It's, <laughs> it, it popped into my head right now, right here. You you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. The fat face of the stupid. Our, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a there's a picture. I don't know if this is... It's the guy uh, with no was, eyes. I, I already know what you're thinking of. You're thinking of the guy with no eyes. <laughs> I know exactly what you're thinking of. 
Um, he is the badge of our our time. I mean, he really. I don't know if it's if it's uh, uh, copywritten, so I yeah. I uh, I can't. Uh, we can't really show it to you. I don't think. But uh, yeah, I uh, I love this picture. It just is so. It's so now. It's so happening. It's so where we are. It's so us. Yes. All right. You oh. can send that to me. Um, even though I know it, I can see it in my mind. Um, but um, all right. We're, we got to move on. We're a little bit behind. Um, John says, would Charles be able to explain the concept in origins of muscular Christianity? Well, yes. Uh, during the 19th century, uh, there was especially a reaction to Anglo-Catholicism and things like that. There arose the school of, you guessed it, muscular Christianity, uh, which basically rebelled against two things. One is the what they consider to be the over-intellectuality of... Uh, there you go. There's our friend. The over-intellectuality of uh, uh, theology and so forth. And the other was the... Uh, the other. The, you see, he's laughing. He's happy. See? See how happy he is? <laughs> Somebody just said something uh, that really got him to laugh. You know, like... <laughs> You can't make water flow uphill. <laughs> okay. Like that. Yeah. You can tell he's very, very superior. You know, he knows. He's like, you're, he probably wrote that letter to you. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, the thing was that the muscular Christianity was partly uh, about doing things. You know, the, the active virtues. It was about uh, feeding the hungry and uh, enlightening the ignorant and so on. So it was very evangelistic. Its best known practitioner was a man named Reverend Charles Kingsley, who was a big enemy of Colonel Newman. Uh, they, they, in fact, his, uh, he attacked Colonel Newman's uh, integrity. And Carl Newman wrote Apologia Pro Vita Sua in response. Uh, things like the YMCA came out of muscular Christianity, the Young Men's Christian Association, uh, and all sorts of urban missions for the poor and, and things like that. This was all muscular Christianity. Uh, the Salvation Army. And indeed, the Salvation Army's attitude toward the sacraments is sort of interesting because uh, General William Booth, the founder of the army, uh, was a Methodist minister, but they wanted to remove from the Salvation Army's good works all doctrinal uh, disputes. So he abolished the, uh, the sacraments, baptism and communion, which the Methodists still have. He got rid of that because he felt the sacraments were things that Christians would argue about forever. It was a pointless waste of time when there were a lot of uh, poor people to be fed, and drugs to be redeemed, and so on and so on. So I would say the Salvation Army was about as muscular Christianity as it got. Hmm. Okay, so the active virtues, okay. Yep. Uh, what is the actual relationship between the church and the sciences? Well, traditionally, uh, monasteries in particular were centers of learning, and they were centers as a result of scientific study. Uh, it's no coincidence that people like Gregor Mendel, the Benedictine monk who really discovered genetics, uh, did the sorts of things they did uh, for a long time. The clergy were the best educated people, and they had uh, more leisure time than most. And so 
a lot of what we know uh, in terms of medieval science we got from them. Roger Bacon, uh, Robert Gross Test, people like that. Uh, so the church has always been the patroness of the sciences. But with the uh, rise of atheistic scientism in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, the scientific community became ever more atheistic. And of course, in the end, science today became a sort of dogma of its own, which is a real uh, perversion of what science is supposed to be about. You know, when you hear people say something like, believe the science, it's stupid. Because science is not something to be believed. It's something to be tested. See if it works. If it works, you keep a particular uh, theory going until and unless it stops working. And then you dump it without a second thought. That's science. Well, if they're going to say that, I'm going to say believe my science. Because now they've n- n- now they're they're going into faith and and uh, relativism and stuff like that. Oh, that's your well, science. I no, I I believe that you're a, I believe that you're a jerk. How's that? <laughs> well, I believe that. Uh, no, I I mean, you get you get so many things uh, today. There's a very famous. Uh, let me see if I can get the lady's name. Uh, I never remember her name, which is unfortunate, except her first name is Mary. I can remember that. Uh, are, but... you, are you doing the white... Are, are you are you doing the one where you're talking about differences in cultures and um, white privilege? No, Mary... Sh- no, Mary Schweitzer. Mary Higby Schweitzer. Okay. Uh, the... Uh, yeah, this uh, Mary Higby Schweitzer is an American paleontologist at North Carolina State University who led the groups that discovered the remains of blood cells in dinosaur fossils and later discovered soft tissue remains in the Tyrannosaurus rex specimen, MOR 1125. And she, since then, she's discovered organic compounds in a lot of other fossil bones. Now, this was a big problem. The reason why it was a big problem is that up until 2000, science was convinced, paleontology was convinced, that uh, organic matter could only last 100,000 years. And fossilization was supposed to be a process that worked in a very even manner, like so. So... Because she had this Tyrannosaurus rex femur that was too big to load in the uh, helicopter, she cut it in half and found these organic compounds. Well, this was problematic for two reasons. One, either organic matter can last a lot longer than we thought it could, or those dinosaur, that dinosaur was alive a lot more recently than it's supposed to be. Worse yet, the fossilization process, instead of being this even thing, starts outside and works inward. The problem is we don't have a model to explain that. In other words, we don't know what fossilization is. We don't know how it works. We don't know how long it takes. We don't know anything about it, except that it occurs. We know that much. Now, what really makes me laugh about this particular reality is that whenever I mention it to a scientist, they inevitably say, oh, so I guess you believe the world was created in 4004 AD. And my response is always the same. No. What I'm saying is I don't know. And more importantly, you don't know. Your mouth moves. But you have no idea how old the Earth is. You have no idea how old life is. You can't. Because all of the presuppositions your views are based on have been destroyed. So what you need to do, if you're an honest scientist, is go back to the physical uh, evidence and try to come up with something that fits what you actually have. It's that simple. 
I feel like it's easier to go on pretending. Well, so do they. And, and to have all the answers. I don't. So think, do they. I don't think scientists don't like admitting not knowing. No, of course they don't. Nobody does. I mean, who in his right mind likes <laughs> yeah. to say, you know, all this crap I've been peddling to you all these years? It's crap. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, who, who, who are you going to get to say that happily? Good point. And you know something else? Not only am I really ignorant, I'm also dishonest because you're going to keep pretending. <laughs> now, I, I, if you are going to get into he's ignorant, you're really not going to get into it. He's dishonest on top of it. All right. Final question today is from Will, who says, which centuries of church history does Charles think were the best and the worst? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. The best? Well, I would say, in some sense, the 6th century, the 500s, when East and West were still very much united and the Muslims had not yet taken over the Near East. Uh, What was the the situation with the Aryans? Uh, that had pretty much passed. Wow. Okay, that's a pretty good one then. Yeah, it's pretty good. I would say the hmm. short period under Charlemagne. Uh, the 13th century. When we think of all the holy men, Aquinas and Bonaventure and so on and so forth. It was an amazing time. Uh, and then I suppose, in a sense, the 19th century, simply because it was the period of the great Catholic literary and other revivals. But, I mean, you'll notice that each of these periods had problems. Now, as to what was worst, I would say the 300s, the Aryan heresy. I thought you said the 6th century. That's one of the best, the 500s. Oh, 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 okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm in the late three, early 400s. Okay. No, I'm I'm in the worst. I would say the uh, late 800s and the 900s, the pornocracy, was really, really pretty awful. Uh, And so far, the 21st century. I was wondering if you're going to go there. Hmm. Portocracy 2, Electric Boogaloo. Shake your groove thing, Tuchita. I think the whole thing is going to be very short-lived, to be honest. It seems so unsustainable. Um, it really well, does to me. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think, if anything, uh, fiducia uh, uh, supplicants, uh, I'm not, you know, people have come up with their own version of trash can custodians, and each and every one of them is obscene, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay. I'm not doing that. But this is a family show, if you're part of the Manson family. Anyway, uh, I, I stole that from... Uh, from the guy that wrote L.A. Confidential. What's his face? Uh, well, that's what he said about L.A. Confidential. He said it's a family film if you're part of the Manson family. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I met him, too, and I can't think of his name. It's, <sighs> it's hard being old. But, uh, no, so I, I, uh, but I, I think that in all likelihood, Fiducia Supercards has probably poisoned a great many of the Cardinals against the status quo. Now, what that will look like in terms of who they elect, who knows, but... You know what I noticed in in your list of best to worst is that... um, Because I was looking at the spacing, and in your list, in your two lists... There were no adjacent best worst centuries except the 19th and 20th centuries. 
No, it said 21st. Oh, 21st? Oh, did you say 21st? Okay. So you wouldn't say 20th? No. I don't I don't know if that's fair to say it's 21st. We're, we're, we're a quarter of the way in. Um... Right, I mean, uh, yeah, but we've got we've had just in the past uh, in the past uh, eleven years, we've had as much crap as the whole pornocracy uh, poured together, flowing out like a sewer. There's a you know that could be a modern day hymn. Love is flowing like a sewer, flowing over you and me. Love is flowing. They're so chunky, like a sewer. We'll be free. That kind of that really worked, actually. <laughs> no, I think so. We could sing that as our as our uh, our modern hip. Love is flowing like a sewer. Yeah, flowing over you and me. <laughs> Love is flowing, goes so chunky. Uh, like a sewer, we'll be free. All right. Um, what? We're out of time, Charles. How Let's wrap it up. Out? Let's wrap it up. Three hundredth episode. You, yeah. How can you say we're out of town? This is the three hundredth episode. Surely it should be at least three hundred times longer <laughs> okay let's go all right we're just getting started get a cup of coffee Let, let's, yes. let's settle in, gang. Settle in. <laughs> we're gonna be here a while <laughs> this, is only, this is for the third of the episode ladies and gentlemen we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have an off the menu marathon 24 hours non-stop how do they do it ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> well that would be fun, the uh, uh, off the menu marathon. Yeah, is... we actually, as I remember, years ago we did kind of a marathon. We uh, we recorded like three or four episodes in one day. Right. Yeah. And then we offloaded them in in individual episodes, unbeknownst to the the public. Yeah, who didn't even notice we were wearing <laughs> the same clothes. So. Uh, I don't know. But seriously, though, uh, yeah, I, I do feel though this is a very special occasion. 300 episodes, ladies and gentlemen, as opposed to having an episode, which is a totally different thing. You know, when you're having an episode, that's, yeah. that's not identical to, you know, producing an episode. Yeah. That's... You don't roll on the floor so much, and, you know. <laughs> strike your 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 breast with your hand and kind of roll your tongue around. You don't do that no. when you're producing with it. When you have an episode, that's more all that kind of thing. Yeah. But rather than having an episode, uh, I I think that uh, when we started this show, Barack Obama was president of the United States. Benedict the Sixteenth was Pope. Um, no, he wasn't. Uh, he, uh, Francesco was uh, was Pope. Uh, so we had we had Obama, we had Francis. Elizabeth was Queen. Roe v. Wade was the law of the land, and I, I wanted to mention this because you kept talking about it. You kept talking about it. You kept lording over it, and the way it was talked, it was like. I don't know. It's it's it, it felt like it was going to be here forever, and then now it it did, it, it, and now it's gone. And it's easy it's to gone. take that for granted, to be honest, a little bit. Well, it's gone, but it being gone, they they took the fig leaf away because we were able to conceal our personal responsibility for infanticide under Roe v. Wade. But now that it's been taken away. And that every state that's passed an infanticide amendment where, uh, where it's been proposed, every state has passed it. And every, uh, the great electorate, the great people of every state that have had pro-life measures presented to them have knocked out each and every one. 
You have had uh, legislatures pass pro-life measures. You have had governors pass pro-life uh, proclamations of different kinds. But in terms of the great people, the, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Our fellow Americans, de a dead baby is a good baby. That's what we are. That's what we're become. Who's to say we're wrong? Except God, of course, and history. Wouldn't it be terrible if because we've had a lack of births, everything collapsed? Wouldn't that be awful? Imagine that when I'm on Social Security, I'm eating dog food because there aren't enough people to keep the system going. That's why immigration is so important. Exactly. Fortunately, we're spreading our infanticide to foreign nations as well and to the immigrants. So eventually we're going to run out of it all. And then we'll really pay a price. Oh, well, that'd be fun. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the babies that aren't born are the ones who will not be keeping you from eating dog food. I told you about the time after a, a party, or actually during a party in Hollywood, I went up to uh, get, a, get more food and booze because we were running low. And the lady I was with, we were shopping at the Beachwood Market up the top of Beachwood Canyon. And we saw this beautifully dressed old lady. I mean, she was beautiful white hair. You would have loved to have had this woman as your grandmother. Made up, but totally age appropriate. You know, and lovely jewelry, just perfect for her age. But she was pushing a, a shopping cart. And the shopping cart was filled with two things and two things only. Cans of dog food and bottles of scotch. And my friend looks at me and looks at it at the cart and says, what do you think that means? I said, it's easier to keep down when it's marinated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Behold our future, ladies and gentlemen. You see, how do I put this? If you murder the next generation, you're not going to have a lot of a future of your own. I don't know how much clearer one can make this. You, you know, um, th th this reminds me of a different message. Someone – we kind of haven't talked about this on this show. I forgot what what um, what people were talking about this, but it was the notion that basically you're going to have a, a heck of a lot of pissed off women who, because they don't – they've abandoned their – you know, ability to to have kids, and then they don't have kids, and and then that will be a societal issue, is handling well, that, it, that fallout. It, what do you think? It will that? be. Yeah. No, I, I think it's I think it's true, and I, I think it's the counterpart of the problem in China, where you know the government for a long time had this one child policy, so a lot of female infants were murdered, and there's a horrible. Uh, disproportion between the number of men and the number of women in China. Now, of course, at the time that this was adopted, nobody, not the scumbags in Washington, not the scumbags in the UN, none of the scumbags that run the show, bothered to say, hey, what kind of horrible, disgusting dictatorship has that kind of power over its subjects? I mean, it didn't bother us because we were making money out of them. And, you know, in America, business is, the, the business of America is business. Well, you didn't just say that. You, you, you've you actually had a really interesting opinion. on It wasn't just that we were quiet for business reasons. There's Your also racism. Yeah, racism, you said. There's also racism. I mean, we got too many Chinese anyway. We should get rid of them. That, so nobody really cared. Nobody Nobody thought this was a bad thing. And it's, it's horrific that any government on the face of the planet should have that kind of power over its subjects. It's just disgusting. And the fact that nobody cared precisely because of their color is even worse. But I digress. Our, we'll have a lot of pissed off, frustrated women who, you know, swallow the lie. It, 
they'll have a lot of scotch and a lot of dog food, I guess. Well, that's true. And you know, the sad thing, men who don't have children, uh, obviously our lives can be extremely inconvenient because there's nobody to look after us. But it doesn't have the same internal pain that it does for women. And for women, it's not just a question of someone to look after you. It's a question of your very reason for being. And of course, the happiest women who aren't mothers, they sublimate it. Uh, they're nuns, they're, they're teachers. In other words, they fill maternal roles, nurses. Uh, but for a career woman, you know, she spent her life getting to the top of her, her insurance firm. Psst. What's that? But as I like to say to the young people I'm surrounded with here, don't look at it as though we boomers screwed everything up for you. Look at it as we created for you a series of character building challenges. Doesn't that sound better? You sanctify us. Yes. By making basically. us walk. <laughs> That's right. By giving you a harder faith walk. We sanctify you. It's true. And see, once again, once again, both our parents, whose old age we made very holy in the same way, we sanctified their, their, their dotage. Similarly, we're sanctifying your youth and middle age. And once again, we get no credit. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, I feel... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know we about that one. Our, we get a lot of opprobrium. We don't get any credit for what we've done for you. It's not what we've done to you. It's not, she. you know, the boomers gave me a, a chance to become a better person. We don't get that. We don't hear that. You hear complaints and whining. Maybe the boomers were sort of like baked into that De Montfort prophecy where the, the, the saints of of the later times will, will tower over the, the old saints like the cedars of Lebanon to a shrub. Maybe that's all made no. possible by the boomers. It could be true. It could be exactly true. And then you'll really have to thank us. <laughs> Just, I mean, basically, what you've got to bear in mind is that ours was a generation like no other. We were so misunderstood and so unappreciated and so underloved. And you know, the sad thing is people say, oh, the boomers were the best educated. Their, their, their youth was when the, the country was the wealthiest. You don't know what a burden that was for us. You don't know how hard it was trying to live up to the expectations that that, that kind of a background gave us. You know, it was hard. It was very hard. Uh, Bill Beersack gave me a book on the darker side of Laurel Canyon in the 60s. And the guy basically is his thesis is that the uh, the hippie movement was uh, put together to discredit the anti-war movement, and his argument is that so many of the rock and roll people came from privileged and military and political backgrounds. What I see now is not that at all. I don't see conspiracy. I see a whole generation deserting what their fathers had built up. But that desertion, you don't understand the pain they went through having such privileged upbringing. It was so hard. I mean, how, how could we even live with that? So we had to break free of all restraints. You know, I, I'd feel better if you were looking really impressed right now. 
I'm but waiting. I, I'm waiting for you to deflate like a like a hot air balloon or something, because all I'm hearing is this praise and uh, of of the greatest generation, uh, which is the boomers, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, we didn't ha we didn't have to win a war or survive a depression. We didn't need to to be great. Oh, okay. Okay. See, our fathers had to do that. And they couldn't measure up to our high standard. Right. Because, see, they never had the self-acceptance, the level of self-acceptance that we have. Okay. Who's the patron saint of self-acceptance? Judas. <laughs> Judas? <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, you want deflation? You just got it. Oh man! The, uh, but you know, you you look you looked slightly uh, physically ill when I was going through that particular song and dance. Yeah, I don't know. My body—it's strange. It has a negative physical reaction to when you start talking about the boomer generation. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but um, I think that's sad. You know, I think if there's any one anthem, and there are actually many, but if there's any one anthem. For my generation, it would be, I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Okay. Okay. Wait, what? All right. Uh, that's going to do it you... for this episode, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Remember, I, I, if it's Monday. <laughs> it's off the menu. And what about the soul you save? It may be your own, even if you're a boomer, but. What? Why do you have that look of physical revulsion? I'm smiling. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bye, guys. We'll see you on the 301st episode. See you then. Cha -cha. <laughs>